Think of your most crystal clear memory right now. Got it? What if I told you it's probably mostly made up? Recent discoveries about how our brains work reveal something shocking about memory that changes everything we thought we knew about human consciousness, and therefore everything that we're looking for in AI consciousness. In our quest to understand the nature of the mind itself, we find ourselves at a remarkable threshold. Welcome to Dude Thoughts, where we examine the fundamental patterns of how humans think, learn, and perceive. Our computational tools have begun to mirror aspects of our own cognition, yet creating true artificial general intelligence requires understanding the deeper principles that guide human thought. I'm Evan Goldstein, a licensed engineer and data scientist, and I invite you to join me on this journey into the very essence of what makes us think. The quirky aspect of being human is that sometimes we feel like memory is on our side and other times it seems to betray us. The philosopher Nietzsche said that forgetfulness is like a strength of sorts for humans, but we've also built this thing called memory to help keep it in check. Memory can be pretty confusing. Almost everyone thinks that they've got one and it feels essential to being human. Without memory, how do we know anything? We've all experienced those moments when our memory slips, whether it's forgetting a name or misplacing a key. And then there's that thing where you notice memory loss in others too, which is eerie. But you can't actually touch or see your memory. It's not like a ball that you can roll around. You only get the vibes of it, and you can guess and feel that it exists based on how you think and how you feel. So let's take a second to really ask ourselves, how do we even know that memory is a real thing. It's not as straightforward as it seems. Figuring out what's a memory and what isn't can be very tricky. You lack a clear label for it like you do for colors. The word memory can mean a lot of things too. If we call any persistent thought a memory, then pretty much everything we think should count. Even how we label our sensory experiences is influenced by what we remember about them. Think about it this way. If you say, I remember sitting in the chair, you're really talking about a memory of sitting in the chair, not the experience itself, which is long gone. There's a gray area in memory. What about remembering thoughts or making plans? And if you feel that you're getting value from this video, I would encourage you to push the like button because it lets me know that I'm making content that you want to see and it helps spread it to others. Thank you. How about those beliefs that you've cooked up? Are the lies that you tell yourself real? All of these pop into your head days or even years later. So they seem like memories, right? Even deciding what counts as true memory could be a memory itself. But we don't usually call those fleeting thoughts memories. Why not? That often depends on how you look at it in the moment. What makes a memory? Memory is a tricky subject. And it's not easy to separate it from all those other mental events that happen in your brain but you've definitely got some idea of what memory is. At least you did until you watched this episode. So where does that idea come from? And if there's no clear definition, what is it that you have? One thing to consider is that we've got a single word for it, and that affects how we view it. But even with that word, your understanding of memory isn't solid. When you're just hanging out with your thoughts, they can all jumble together. Sometimes memory is the answer, and sometimes memory fits what you're doing. But at other times, it feels off. You might even change your mind about it. So what stands out? You can't just slap the label memory onto a thought randomly. There's usually a reason. But what makes memory special? Maybe it feels grounded in reality. When you say that someone has a good memory, you're saying that they can recall events pretty reliably, right? Add their own spin on things, then it feels less accurate. But even the best memories are just that. They're just memories of subjective experiences, not the raw reality. Everyone sees and hears in their own unique way. And two people can have different versions of the same event and still be praised for their memory. If two folks saw someone leave a bar from different angles and later compared it to video footage, they might both have had good memories even if the details between their stories vary. So in the end, calling a memory accurate often depends on why you're judging it in the first place. All right, so when we talk about memory being some sort of objective truth, it opens a whole can of worms. Can you actually remember your own thoughts? Like when I say, I remember thinking Tim was trying to attack me. 
But this is the catch. No one can back that up. So we often just go along with it, especially when we're trying to explain a situation. It's like saying they hit Tim first because they thought they were in danger. If we're going to buy into that reasoning, then we're also saying that thoughts are real things that you can remember pretty accurately. If someone claims, I remember making up that fairy tale based on my own childhood, not because it looks like someone else's work, we'd have to take their word for it. So in a nutshell, people feel comfy labeling something as a memory as long as it sort of seems to connect to something that's actually real. A memory only holds weight if it reflects a real event. If over time it changes, then those new bits stop being a memory and turn into fabrication. But until someone points out your mistake, you'll probably still just carry it and call it as a memory. Here's the twist. When you say that your memory of a sunset was a real experience, what you're actually doing is linking a thought about the sunset back to another thought about when you saw that sunset ages ago. You're not actually referring to reality as it was since that was years ago. The separation between memory and reality is made up, just two different sets of thoughts colliding. When I say the memory reflects reality, I'm claiming that after the fact. It's not like there's a built-in quality of the thought itself that makes me instantly recognize it as memory. The whole memory label gets tacked on later to show what it means. means. This difference becomes very obvious when we get into abstract thinking. Think about statements like, I remember you were angry, or I remember when our government was competent. Those are tricky because they deal with abstract ideas like anger and competence. That can't be checked aside from just saying, yes, I guess the government was competent once. Memory? Memory in those cases isn't about clear-cut things like the color of a ball. It's used to make sense of everyone's personal feelings. This makes the idea of memory pretty broad, almost blending into a shared opinion. In these moments, memory serves to mainly to help us connect with others and to agree on what really happened based on our own thoughts. We've been talking about how slapping the label memory on a thought is pretty much a call on whether it sticks or not. It's something that you can just check off to verify. There's nothing about it, no feature that helps us decide what counts as a memory. Plus, the idea of separating a memory from the actual thing that happened is made up at the end of the day, after the fact. It's just a mess of thoughts pulled from what you've lived through, mixed in with thoughts about what you think is real. A memory doesn't have to actually be directly tied to events or stuff that happened. It can be all just your thoughts, your beliefs, your feelings, and your opinions. The interesting part is that what really matters in memory isn't the nitty-gritty details or the pixels in it but the way you interpret the mix of colors and sounds that you experience. Two people could recall exactly the same moment completely differently, and getting everyone to agree on it is a whole negotiation. The one thing that these situations share is that when you call something a memory, you're not saying that it reflects a real event that you and others can agree on. Like, I remember when you were going to the floor, so I decided to stay home. Of course, you can be totally off base. The truth of the claim doesn't really matter when it comes to labeling a memory. It just needs to be something that you believed was true at the time. This whole concept it can be a bit mind-boggling. So up until now, you've probably felt pretty sure about what memory meant, and you might even have a classic example stuck in your mind, like standing on a mountain with a gorgeous sunrise that you remember vividly. You might be thinking, if these thoughts aren't rooted in reality, then where did they even come from? Just to clarify, that isn't saying that you can think of memories that reflect real experiences because you definitely can. The catch is that you can never be totally sure how much those of those thoughts is just extra fluff, or it's just what you believed you were feeling at the time. So believing something is a memory doesn't really come from how it lines up with what actually happened in the real world. Something else leads you to that conclusion. One possibility is that you personally checked it out and found out that it makes sense alongside all the other things that you've experienced in life. But just because things don't add up doesn't mean that they're wrong. You can always chalk it up to exceptions or just misunderstandings. There's really no automatic system in our brains that keeps everything consistent, especially since consistency isn't even clearly defined when any and all the experiences are on the table. You can't just look at a memory and say it's true in itself. Even when it comes to things that actually happened, our memories change every time we bring them up. Two people might remember the same event totally differently, and figuring out why those memories shift isn't easy. 
but they sure don't change to become more accurate. Your brain just doesn't seem to sweat the details as much. Instead, it's more about finding thoughts that work for you and suit your goals. Making your memory better usually takes some conscious effort, but at some point you might decide to learn different tricks like mnemonics. When you think it's crucial to help your brain hold on to stuff better, the fact that you actually need to actively seek out these skills shows that your memory isn't naturally improving without some motivation. Without reasons like school or social situations or exams, you probably not bother putting in the effort. So let's take uh, social credibility, for example. Sometimes your reputation rides on how accurate your memories are, which is part of why it's hard to shake off the idea that memory is a straightforward reflection of reality. Questioning whether your memory on a beach day is legitimate ultimately shakes your own credibility, which isn't a comforting thought. Calling something a memory is a way of telling others, hey, this is a trustworthy take on reality, even if deep down, you know that that's not always the case. On the flip side, having a not-so-accurate memory can usually help you out. A lot of people assume that a sharp memory is automatically great for survival, but often it can put you in a tough spot. You remember things that others want to forget or twist. If your credibility is on the line, then having a memory that fits with what society thinks is real can actually be more valuable. Having a good memory means paying attention to what other people find important, shaping your experience to fit their views, and then ignoring everything else under those conditions. If we go with these ideas, then our understanding of memory kind of falls apart. It, it doesn't really feel like memory anymore. It just gets stuck, it's tweaked to be useful. This isn't to say that you don't have clear impressions of what you've seen and experienced. You definitely do. But if memory means being an accurate reflection of your experiences, then it's fair to say that humans don't have a natural memory. They've got a learned one instead. More importantly, believing in the existence of a memory isn't just about seeing your thoughts line up with reality. Rather, it's about when it becomes useful for you to sync your thoughts with a lot of folks are probably going to laugh this off as totally absurd. It's pretty, it's pretty tough to shake off thousands of years of bias, but how our minds work and come to grips with the idea that our drive to accurately capture reality isn't actually hardwired into our brains. It's more about personal choice than anything else. Some people might even think that questioning this is just muddying the waters of truth that we've already agreed on. Plus, most of us don't really want to dive into how we know our memories reflect something true. We'd rather get stuck in the, some philosophical rabbit hole. In day-to-day -day life, we act and we should act like our memories are mostly spot on, even though all the messy stuff might be stacked against that. But when it comes to building AI systems that are meant to learn about the world, we really need to challenge these basic assumptions about knowledge. If someone brushes that off as a waste of time, they're basically admitting that they aren't invested in understanding how actual intelligence works beneath the surface. They'd rather bank on their gut feelings about the mind than dig deeper, which is shaky ground. This kind of thing is pretty common in AI. Most machine learning approaches are based on the idea that memory's job is to be an accurate mirror of real experiences. Most of the people working in AI are programmers and aren't particularly emotional people. This idea is so entrenched in the field that it's hardly even up for debate. For instance, autoencoders aim to reproduce their input data as closely as they can, just in a more compact form. Finding and using patterns to compress the data is a handy trick. The end goal is always accuracy. Generator models, like large language models and image generators, are also trained to mimic their original material. We judge them based on how well they do that. Aligning with some imagined data distribution is the gold standard in supervised and semi-supervised machine learning. Accuracy is what we aim for in machine learning models, just like we do with each other. A sharp memory gets praised in society as it helps everyone move forward together. So it makes sense that we create our personal ideas of memory from this desire to find common ground with others about what's real. We use the term as a way to enforce that understanding. Memory turns into something like a moral rule, saying, since we care about agreeing, you should have an accurate memory. It's less about a concrete brain function, more about a subjective view that helps us achieve a goal. Saying you should have a good memory is like saying you should be a good person. Don't stop now, I have dozens more videos. This video is part of a playlist, which I'll post for you here so that you can go through and watch other videos that are similar, 
or you can watch our newest videos and we have lots of other playlists. So keep clicking, keep watching. Click over there, right there.